Hello, everyone. This is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. Welcome to a new issue of Space Cafe Podcast, an episode whose course, or rather the end, I would call surprising, to put it mildly. You can, of course, jump to the end now, but that would spoil your fun. Hang in there. I promise it will pay off. So, who do we have in the red chair today? To be honest, we do not have any red chairs here in our studio. We're doing it online like everything else this year. And we try to produce the best and most optimal quality for you. Starting with the selection of our guests to a decent audio quality. In this episode, we're talking to a fascinating and hard-boiled woman who has conquered more male domains than an entire army of men put together. I know, I know, such comparisons are annoying for some, but until we have reached the point where we have equal numbers of men and women in our governments and executive boards, we need to keep reminding ourselves that women are just as cool as the remaining 51.9% of humanity. Come on, guys, we can do that. So, on to our guest. Pam Melroy was a veteran of Operation Just Cause and Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm back in the 90s, with over 200 combat and combat support hours. She was a test pilot, headed a department in the super mysterious DARPA, and she spent almost 38 days as an astronaut on the International Space Station, ISS, with one of the most challenging and dangerous extravehicular activities in history. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, Space Cafe Podcast brings you Pamela Malroy. I live in Arlington, Virginia, which is uh, very close to Washington, D.C. Good. I'm sorry I... I already granted myself a glass of wine because it's already evening over here. I so. understand. I do a lot of phone calls <laughs> with Australia and it's, uh, it's usually at seven or eight o'clock at night my time. So uh, I appreciate you being flexible with my schedule today. Absolutely. No problem. So let's jump right into the fact of the matter. Do you miss the shuttle days? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I've been a, a pilot uh, for, you know, my career, uh, I went from flying one airplane in school to, you know, flying the KC-10 operationally. And, uh, when I went to test pilot school, I missed the plane that I I'd flown before. Uh, <laughs> but I got to fly new airplanes. And then when I went to NASA, I was flying other airplanes. And so I think, yes, I think you, you always, you always cherish those experiences, but it's a part of life to learn that uh, there are new chapters and new experiences ahead of you and that you shouldn't hang on to what's in the past uh, because what's coming should be just as good. So do you miss that gravity when you get pushed back into the seat? I mean, like the only way to repeat that on Earth would be to buy a Tesla, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, I think I do. I mean, the whole experience is very exciting and uh, and it's unique. Uh, but, you know, I think most people uh, would say that what they miss the most uh, would be looking at the Earth from space and the sense of microgravity and, and floating around and, and looking at the Earth. I mean, I think that's that's the thing that's uh, uh, fortunately it's locked up here in my head. I've got got some wonderful pictures and I have pictures and video to remind me of the great experience. But if I could, uh, could have that experience, uh, the rocket rides exciting, but it, it's nothing compared to looking at the earth from space. Wow. For a long time, the space shuttle was sort of the epitome of the future. It never seemed to get old and still it seems like a different age these days. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the space shuttle was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, it really was. It was incredibly capable. I mean, the the cool things that we see today are very cool, but uh, frankly, they're not 
capable of doing a lot of the things that the space shuttle could do. And that's okay. The space shuttle was not capable of doing a lot of the things that we see vehicles flying today. You know, I'm a test pilot. That's my background. And so what you do is you take a look at a design and you appreciate it for, you know, did it accomplish the mission? You know, did, did it, you know, how good is it at doing what it was designed to do? And uh, so, you know, by the same factor, you don't, uh, you don't take a look at, uh, for example, a, uh, a truck and say, but it's not a very good sports car. Well, it, mm-hmm. it may not be, but it's what it was designed to do. And if it's really good at that, then, then, you know, that's, so that's kind of my perspective about it. It's, uh, it was an extraordinary vehicle. It definitely had, we, we learned a lot and I see the same thing happening now with the space station. There are many aspects of the space station that we've learned f- from operating for 20 years. You know, if we had a chance to do it all again. We'd design it a little differently. And I suspect you'll see that, uh, in the future, uh, in a f- future low earth orbit uh, space station would be very different than the spa- than the international space station during your career as an astronaut do you sort of build up a relationship with that machine with that monster of a shuttle absolutely How does it fe- <laughs> well if you I, think about yeah. it we lived inside it and so you know that's a that's a very special relationship if you think about uh, the way you feel about a, a, a home you, that you lived in, uh, especially if it was very uh, exciting and it kept you alive. So uh, one of the jobs that I had as an early uh, career astronaut was uh, something that we called um, a Cape Crusader, uh, which is an astronaut that goes to Florida and sort of acts as a liaison with the Kennedy Space Center, but more importantly, helped prepare the shuttle for launch, uh, strap crews in, unstrap them after landing. And after uh, spending about a year and a half doing that and launching a lot of all the space shuttles, they all seem to have their own personal uh, characteristics. You know, Columbia was unique in that a lot of the parts were unique and you couldn't even swap them from the other shuttles. It was uh, sort of, you know, this first design so a lot of a lot of it was sort of handmade. Mm. It it was cranky to get off the pad without any doubt. There were always little gremlins. You know, Atlantis and Discovery were very clean, uh, mm-hmm. always ready to go. Uh, Endeavor was just a little unique. It was the newest shuttle, and so you know it was always like, oh yeah, that's right. It's different from all the other ones. So you know you had to remember that. I definitely definitely felt like each one had it had its own character without a doubt character right so i imagine you could whenever you weren't able to sleep at night you would go down to the hangar to the shuttle would that be possible at all you know when the shuttle was in the uh, processing facility uh absolutely and uh especially working as a cape crusader not all astronauts spend that much time at Kennedy Space Center. In fact, that's one really important part of the job as a as a Cape Crusader is that, you know, astronauts come to visit or they come to launch uh, and they come for dress rehearsal and for launch and they're less familiar with the procedures. And and so, you know, you, you had the opportunity to uh, help uh, uh, your fellow astronauts kind of understand uh, how they do things at at uh, Kennedy, but that you know the the great thing was that you were around the hardware all the time, and so you could go to the processing facility. Uh, what was really exciting was going to see the shuttle when it was in the uh, uh, vertical assembly building, the VAB, mm. and uh, you know I got the opportunity to watch a lot of great things that not, you know not many astronauts get to see because they don't spend a lot of time down there, like the whole process with giant cranes and procedures to tip the shuttle from horizontal, which is how it's mostly processed into the vertical to prepare, to put it on the mobile platform to take out for launch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Actually, (laughs) it was an amazing thing to Mm. see this huge vehicle be lifted like that. I I love that. Wow. 
So as I already mentioned, I think this is a different age now when it comes to space travel, speaking of SpaceX, speaking of Blue Origin, Crew Dragon capsule. Would you like to be on board of such a vehicle these days? Um, I I think I would enjoy that very much. You know, I made a decision that it was time to leave NASA. Uh, going to space is fantastic, but there are, you know, are plenty of astronauts behind me waiting for their opportunity. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, you know, learn new things myself and, uh, and to try to stretch and grow as a person. But yeah, I mean, if I could just snap my fingers and go on board, absolutely. Let's move to a different place now. That is DARPA, and that's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. For people outside DARPA, is that a place of desire for all those who want to work 24-7 on the craziest inventions <laughs> and never have to worry about money? Is that so? <laughs> Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's quite that you never have to worry about money. Everyone has to worry about money. But there is truly uh, an appetite, I think, more than usual for risk. And so uh, many people come to DARPA because they have an exciting idea, but uh, it's just too risky uh, for the the usual research organizations, they say, well, you know, there's not mm. a, there's a chance that won't work. And, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't spend money on it, but that's exactly, you know, what DARPA should be doing. And in fact, um, uh, that was, you know, a key criteria is sometimes we said, no, we're not going to do that because it's not high risk, which means someone else should be working on it. To the outside It seems like DARPA is a super secretive place where no information gets out. Now I'm taking total advantage of you being here on the show. Please let us know what's inside, what's going on inside. Well, it's, it's, uh, I've, I've had people say to me, oh, I want to take a tour. But, you know, the truth is it's, it's, it's an office building. Really what, uh, what we, we uh, did at DARPA was to try to find the best uh, in the world and ask them uh, and challenge them uh, to work on a technical project to see what the art of the possible is. And so all of the work is being done in universities, in, in companies. And, and so I think perhaps that might be why it seems mysterious, because you think maybe there's something special going on in that building, but it, but it really isn't. It's, it's, so it's not a black monolith of black glass <laughs> and mirrors. <laughs> Oh, underground no nope. nothing okay, like that no, no underground <laughs> okay so what was so what was your role with darpa during those darpa years so i was the deputy of the tactical technology office and a key part of my job was actually around uh trying to figure out how the department of defense could work with the new commercial space companies which of course now seems you know, obvious. So much is being done, uh, you know, by by the Department of Defense with commercial space, with SpaceX and others. Uh, but I have to say that at the time that I went to DARPA, that wasn't happening. And uh, so that was exciting for me to uh, to to sort of extend what NASA was doing with commercial companies and uh, bring the ideas from those commercial companies to the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the new era, the new generation of, of, of commercial space uh, travel, where do you see spa the space industry headed towards at the moment? Uh, it's pretty amazing how dynamic what's happening in uh, in the space industry right now. I, I think it's the changes have come so rapidly. If you really look at, uh, for example, You know, all the changes that have simply occurred in the in the last decade when uh, SpaceX was, you know, 10 years ago, you know, people were like, who are these crazy people? They had ne never launched to the International Space Station yet. They didn't have all these commercial customers. So I think it's, you know, my conclusion from that is that we're at a, at a very dynamic time. And I think... Uh, I, I would not I would not feel comfortable making a guess what the next decade will bring, except I do believe it will be 
as much change again. Now, it will be very interesting to see if it's possible to have commercial space stations. I think that's definitely something that I'd like to see happen. Uh, and I think that, that the time is right. Commercial space stations like like what? Like a space hotel, finally? Uh, perhaps. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess maybe my bias is towards the science, like we did on the International Space Station. I think we learned a lot from that experience. And uh, I think uh, that it will be very similar to what you saw with SpaceX. There will just be new ways to make that opportunity less expensive. And so, yeah, the alternative business models like tourism and stuff, I think they will happen. The International Space Station is sort of gravitating slowly but gradually towards the end of its lifetime. Do you see another such project, a similar project, or will that project be taken over by the Chinese and will the rest of the world jump on board the Chinese station? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I would, you know, I personally think that, uh, that the next step is going to be commercial. And what I mean by that is that governments that want to do scientific research of which there's still plenty to do in low earth orbit will simply pay for space on board a, uh, a, a commercial vehicle. And so, uh, to me that, you know, that model, I think we, we, we have learned enough to do it that way. I don't think the next space station necessarily has to be a government space station. Mm. How long does it last, the, the ISS? How long does it have? Well, you know, who knows? We we uh, always hope for the best. I think, you know, there was a huge investment put into it that is, you know, every day that we do science aboard uh, is a good day. Uh, because we continue to amortize the cost and the value of, of what we put into it. You know, the, the conventional right now, I think it's uh, 2024, but the station, you know, the work was done to, to show that it could survive to 2028. Y you know, the truth is there are certain aspects of the station that we, we just didn't know. We took our best guess and did some design work to try to make sure that it would last a certain time. Mm. But, you know, if there's a really bad day and something breaks, that's just True. too expensive to fix. True. I mean, we all live with that, right? You never know when True. that's going to happen to your car. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So uh, you've seen the space station a bunch of times from the inside and from the outside. So usually uh, when it comes to housing, houses usually get an overhaul every one or two decades. So how does it feel How does the space station look and feel from the inside? Does it like look like an old place, like an old place from the 90s? <laughs> uh, a little bit, yes. I would definitely say that it was clearly designed in the 90s without any question. But, uh, you know, it's had, uh, you know, multiple crews living aboard and shuttle crews visiting and other visiting crews. Uh, I think the real issue is actually storage. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. I mean, there's stuff everywhere. I was just looking actually at some video from my first flight, which was 20 years ago. Uh, to, it was before the first crew had even started living aboard the station. And what was interesting about it was, uh, the fact that the, Uh, the node, uh, which, you know, is one of the older elements of the space station, uh, just, it's just, it was empty. There was nothing mm. in there. And, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of supplies and logistics to keep six humans alive and all the science that they're doing. And so that's, I think the, you know, the more noticeable thing about it than anything is just, wow, there is stuff everywhere. I've always wondered why the space station isn't kept any shinier and neater on the inside. I mean, like, why are all those wires and hoses so visible? Why are not they behind panels or boards or whatnot? Well, in, in many cases, it's it's very simple. It's really just that they're temporary. They're, mm -hmm. they, they may be, you may have to, to disconnect it or it was, it's something that was put together After the vehicle was designed, they realized something didn't work as well, or they could get more functionality out of it. So uh, it's, 
I think you should see all that as uh, the sign of a, a vehicle that we've come to know. And, uh, you know, if you build a house the first time yourself, there's always things you're like, whoa, if mm-hmm. I'd known, I would have done this a little differently. And so, uh, you know, you do everything in your power to make it functional. So it is sure. very cluttered inside, though. I won't disagree with you there. It really is. You had a bunch of memorable moments on the space station, but one I could imagine was pretty dramatic. That's when you had your spacewalk to repair the, one of the solar panels. I think this is a moment you will always remember. Could you could you go into that one more time for us? Yes, yes, that was uh, an amazing moment. And it's really interesting to look back at it and remember uh, there were a lot of other things going on at the same time. Uh, so it was on my third flight on Discovery, and we had an incredibly busy uh, mission scheduled. We were actually planning to do <clears throat> uh, possibly up to five spacewalks because we were going to do uh, a spacewalk to test out some uh, RCC, the re- reinforced carbon carbon on the leading edge of the shuttle, to, to figure out if there was uh, a problem, how would we repair it? And so that's a problem that NASA had been working on actually since the Columbia mishap. And so uh, we were going to test a new design for that. Uh, But we had a lot of things to do first. We had to install a new element, and then we had to relocate the solar array and unfurl it. And that was sort of the first three space flights. And then the last two were going to be uh, a lot of different uh, projects that we were working on, like the RCC repair and some other things. There had been a little bit of an issue with one of the solar array rotary joints, and the ground was noticing that there was a little bit of grinding or vibration uh, that had begun to pick up on that solar array rotary joint. And during one of the earlier uh, spacewalks, the spacewalker, who was Dan Tawney, pulled back the uh, the, the blankets, that uh, the thermal blankets that covered it, and looked at it and said, wow, it looks like there's some grease here that has metal filings in it. And as we all know, that's not good, right? (laughs) It's like, ooh. And so what's interesting is even though, uh, so, so that was, that was earlier in the third spacewalk and, and at the end of the third spacewalk, or maybe it was the second spacewalk. Anyway, the crew was coming back inside after having successfully bolted down the solar array. So Peggy Whitson and I were deploying the solar array uh, when, uh, there was a lot of glare, it was a really high sun angle. And, uh, so Peggy was operating the computer. I was looking at the cameras, keeping the big picture on the procedure and it came out of glare and I saw something that clearly didn't look right. So Mm -hmm. I, I called for an abort and, uh, then we kind of, uh, floated over to the space shuttle where we could, you know, get out the binoculars and see if we could, Uh, get a better look at what was going on. And we were absolutely horrified when we saw that there was uh, a big rip in the solar array. Uh, Mm -hmm. What what wasn't really evident, I think, until until, uh, my spacewalker, Scott Perizinski, got out there is there were actually two rips in the solar array. Pretty serious malfunction because uh, the solar array was not fully deployed. So it was a little bit like the sail on a boat. You want it nice and taut or you want it flat on the deck. If it's sort of flapping around uh, in a middle position, that's mm-hmm. not a good place to be. And especially because as, as the shuttle undocks or docks, you have to fire braking thrusters, either to push yourself away or slow yourself down. And so the those thrusters cause vibrations on the solar array really important that they're nice and and tight. Mm. So we had to figure out how to repair the solar array, but also uh, how to deploy it so that it was nice and snug. And, but at the time, uh, at the end of that spacewalk, uh, the ground was much more focused on the problem with the solar array joint. And, Mm. you know, they were like, okay, we want you to get ready to do a spacewalk to go, you know, take a closer look at that, that solar array joint with the, the, the metal shavings in the grease. And we said, okay. And we spent, uh, just about 24 hours doing that. And, uh, then, uh, the ground came back to us and said, uh, yeah, on second thought, this solar array thing, 
it's a lot more serious. <laughs> and so <laughs> you have to repair it before you undock. You have to. And we're like, well, wait a second. You've always told us to stay away from that thing because it's fully electrified and there's no way to remove the electricity from the solar array. It always generates electricity. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it was quite a dangerous uh, procedure. So we had to put together procedures to protect our spacewalkers. We used uh, electrical insulating tape uh, all over anywhere there was metal on their spacesuits. Uh, so that so was, you had to improvise here. We had to there improvise, There was no protocol yeah. for that. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, pretty interesting. It was very much of a, sort of an Apollo 13 moment. Mm. You know, here's what we've got on the shuttle and the station. This. And we used up all of the capped on tape on the, on the space station and about half of what we had on the shuttle. And uh, one of the things uh, that I did, it's not that unusual for a visiting shuttle crew uh, to have a, a quick conference with the, the uh, station commander and say, is there anything you're short of? Because we were going home <laughs> and if they needed something, you know, we could leave it behind for them. And so we did end up leaving actually uh, some of our uh, small amount of remaining capped on tape with them. You know, I had to make a judgment that how much we were going to need if we had a, an emergency once we were undocked. So I needed to keep some <laughs> just in case we <laughs> needed it for repair. But the, the, the risk I think was, was greater for them. So, yeah. So we had to kind of put our heads together and figure all of that out. And, uh, it was an amazing, uh, procedure the ground came up with. Uh, the first time I heard it, uh, I was sitting with my crew and we're all looking at each other thinking part of being an astronaut is spending a lot of time figuring out what are the rules, right? What are the flight rules? Wow. What are the things that we do for safety? Uh, and so forth. And we're like, I mean, we're starting to count the things that we're doing that we never do. Okay. Wow. But it's, 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 you know, a lot of those rules are there because you're trying to limit risk over time. If you're going to be doing hundreds of spacewalks, building the mm. space station, you would like to set some procedures that will overall minimize risk. But we were in a much more serious situation mm. And so, you know, when people say to me, well, NASA is so not, you know, very risk averse, I'm like, no, 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 you, you have no idea. If they need to do something because it's really serious, they will do it. And, uh, you know, that was fascinating for me as a commander. Uh, so, so many of the things that I took very seriously about safety for the crew. But, you know, we, we put all the mitigations that we could think of. We were very methodical. More importantly, uh, my crew was just superb. Uh, they were superbly trained, uh, thanks to the trainers. But I also challenged them a lot on the ground. I mean, culture is not something that you invent uh, when something bad happens. It's something that you plan in advance. And for mm -hmm. me, it was very carefully planning, uh, reinforcing how the crew works together, what you always do what you never do, uh, those kinds of things. And, you know, that's uh, the ultimate reward as a leader is when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm. And when the whole team works together in a way that one person uh, could never achieve those results by themselves. Wonderful, fascinating goosebumps all over the place. It was special. <laughs> Before let's jump back in time a little. Before your career as an astronaut, you were a test pilot. So, what does a test pilot do other than testing airplanes? But why do you test airplanes? Right. Well, you know, it's really not that different from being an astronaut in some ways. Uh, part of the purpose of a test pilot is uh, that you are an experienced pilot, uh, but typically also uh, someone who is trained as an engineer as well. And, uh, and the value of that is uh, that you understand, uh, you know, the design elements. And so uh, mm -hmm. all aircraft have upgrades, changes. Uh, sometimes it's very simple, some new software. Sometimes it's a brand new airplane. And, and I was fortunate enough to, to fly the C-17 Uh, as a test pilot when it was a brand new aircraft. And uh, and so what that meant was I got the opportunity to do things for the first time in the air airplane. 
and uh, you you have highly trained and experienced test pilots. One of the things that you do as a test pilot is you fly as many airplanes as you can uh, because it gives you sort of a database, like, you know, so that you don't just think there's only one way to solve a problem. You see a lot of aircraft and their unique designs and which ones uh, work really well in some areas in, mm-hmm. in which mm-hmm you know, have, have, uh, struggle a little bit. I was talking earlier about being a test pilot. You appreciate an aircraft for what it was designed for, not what you, you know, you you might find, you know, a certain type of aircraft more interesting than another, but as a test pilot, you're there to make sure it does what it's designed to do, but you're also there to protect all the future pilots who fly it. One, uh, common misperception I think about Astro or, uh, Uh, test pilots is that they are, you know, have a swelled head, very egotistical. But actually in test pilot school, they say, okay, you had many years of flying. You're very good at what you do. We screened you. We selected you. If you get in an airplane and make a mistake, somebody with much less experience than you is likely to make the same mistake Mm -hmm. and, and maybe not even recognize it. So, uh, so that is a different perspective. And so that's when you have to say to the engineers, no, that design is not good enough. And, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, you just made a stupid mistake. And the answer as a test pilot is no. If I made that mistake, someone else is going to make that mistake. And we need to protect the, you know, whether sometimes it's as simple as putting notes and warnings in a, in a, uh, in the man, the flight manual. And sometimes you have to make the decision to say, no, actually, this needs to be changed and it needs to be fixed. You also have to make sure that the aircraft is doing what it was designed to do. So you have to, you know, if it had a certain performance capability, can it really pull that many Gs? Uh, or, you know, is this the real fuel flow or does it burn a lot more uh, gas than you thought it was going to? Those, you know, some of those are less less exciting. Uh, than so you're being... Them. So as a test pilot, you're being paid f- to take the risk that others don't have to. That's that's correct. And that that's why it okay. is in many ways like being an astronaut. I mean, the whole point of uh, of flying in space as, a, as an astronaut to me was so that we could learn about how to keep humans safe in space sure. and make mm-hmm. it safer for those who came after. Mm-hmm. Astronaut, DARPA, test pilot. I'm hesitant to call you badass, but what what else is? <laughs> I think that's that's the only terminology that's appropriate here. Do you see yourself as a badass person? It, not at all, not even in the least. Uh, you know, I I feel like it's my job to uh, to understand and manage risk. Uh, I feel like I have a, a strong technical background that helps enable me to do that. I won't deny that that I'm perhaps a little bit different than some people in that what what it what excites me, you know, I I don't think anything's worth doing if it's not hard. Um mm-hmm. that's a little bit of a different personality characteristic mm-hmm. for sure. So I like challenging things and you know, frankly, I do like things that go boom or explode or you know, have rocket engines or on them or uh, motors, and I don't mind getting dirty, and I enjoy doing all those things. So it's maybe a little different. So, what are you afraid of? Uh, making a mistake. That that's that's a pretty tough thing to do. So I I'd, I'd rather go with the boom uh, experiences uh, you just mentioned. <laughs> and thank you for that very open open uh, answer. Uh, Pamela, you have a better idea than I do, but how would you compare young girls from your generation with those of today? Are there still any hungry young Pamelas out there today? What do you think? Uh, I think there are are plenty. Uh, Actually, I think one of the things that I think is unfortunate is that I'm, you know, extraordinarily stubborn. And uh, so for me, when so many times I was told Girls can't be pilots. They can't be test pilots. They can't be mm. astronauts. Those th- people saying those things to me just made me more determined. You shouldn't have to be. You shouldn't have to be that stubborn. 
I think. Uh, and so I think we still do have some, some challenges, uh, uh, with, uh, the messaging is, is not always very good for girls around, uh, engineering and aviation. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we need some changes, but I would say that the, it's definitely much better than it was when I was a child. One of the things that it's taken me a long time to realize is that I was given dolls to play with, but I was no, just talking no rockets. to no rockets. And I was talking to, uh, someone about this uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and I flashed back on a memory. Yes, I played with dolls. And you know what I did with them? I flew them around like airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I flew them around. I grabbed them by the back and mm -hmm. I played with them like they were flying. And of course. I think about dolls that. Dolls can also fly. Yeah. I, I just, it makes me realize uh, that, uh, you know, it was, there were just so many expectations about what you could and couldn't do. And as, as, as a girl, and, uh, I think things are definitely better, but we're still not there where we should be and where we might want to be. So in what's your opinion on the new generations, how can we get the new generations excited for science? Well, uh, all I can tell you is that I was inspired to become an astronaut by watching the moon landings. And so for me, uh, I actually think giving inspirational, doing inspirational things. So, you know, SpaceX is, has certainly inspired many young engineers. I would like to see us, you know, going back to the moon, onto Mars. I think those things will, uh, will do more to inspire a generation of engineers uh, than all the programs in the world. So, uh, so we me, need, we need more big science. Well, I think we do. Yes. I think, I mm -hmm. think, uh, and, and really the ability to help people understand w what it is that we're doing uh, and the impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pamela, I'm also part of, of that generation that grew up without computers. And at the end of my teenage years, I started to put the first Intel together and, and take it apart to add memory and, and a graphics card. That somehow shaped me and gave me an insight into that foreign world. Today, most computers and smartphones are no longer accessible in that way. Is that good or bad for a new generation of tinkerers or are tinkerers a thing of the past? Well, I, I actually see it a little bit differently. I think uh, you might as well say, well, because you didn't you know, have a slide rule, Uh, then you don't really understand the, the, the science behind what you're doing. And of course, that was ridiculous. Uh, you know, the access to a computer and what it could do uh, was, was transformational for you. I think mm -hmm. that the easier and more accessible uh, the ability to be creative is. So I, I, it's the more innovation you'll see. I love this new trend towards uh, low software, no software, or uh, natural language communications with computers, you know, auto coding, uh, and mm. things like that. I mean, it's think about back in Star Trek, you know, they used to just mm. talk to the computer and say, run an analysis of such and such. <laughs> and uh, how many times have you wished we could do that? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and what it means is uh, literally, uh, Anybody could be a scientist if they could ask the right question. They could get the data generated and mm -hmm. learn something new. So I, I, I'm, a I'm a techno optimist, though, if you hadn't figured that out. <laughs> is, there, is there, speaking of that board computer you were just mentioning, is there a similar board computer on the, the uh, International Space Station? <laughs> It's different than the one on the shuttle. It's, uh, it was, uh, again, we learned a lot from the space shuttle uh, when we went forward to design the space station. And, and so, uh, there were some aspects of it that I think are more robust, 
Uh, certainly the, 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 the shuttle on the computer was incredibly robust, but it wasn't really designed to be upgraded. And so I think that's probably one of the most important things that, that, you know, we figured out and yeah, there are computers. We don't have auto coding, uh, and we don't mm-hmm. have, uh, you can't talk to the computer, but th- there are, you know, access to regular computers as well that allow you to access the internet and to do searches and, and all mm-hmm. that, that stuff. So it's, it's, we're not there yet. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it it's but soon, it's soon, I hope. Wonderful. Let's take the rest of this show to to try and make a, a little bit of an outlook into the future of, of human space travel. So where do you think are we headed towards at the moment? So let's talk about a little bit about the moon, perhaps Artemis, then Mars, whatever comes to your mind and you think is reasonable to think about. Well, I think, uh, you know, I find the uh, Artemis program, Moon to Mars, uh, all very interesting. I do think that that uh, going to the moon is very exciting and inspirational. It's hard. We did know how to do it before, but we did it as a camping trip. And uh, now, which is a very different thing, as as you know, going on a camping trip from instead settling somewhere and creating, you know, a sustainable presence. Uh, so there's there's huge challenges. Uh, one thing that's clear is that there is going to be a very strong commercial influence, particularly in the areas of transportation. As I mentioned, I hope to see uh, low Earth orbit uh, have proliferation of space stations with a variety of of uh, responsibilities. Yes, it might be tourism, but certainly uh, there's plenty to learn from a scientific standpoint still. And uh, it could be more cost effective for governments uh, that are interested in investing in research uh, to, to do it with a commercial partner. So I think we'll see all of those things. Do you see a permanent outpost other than the ISS on the moon anytime soon? This is all about learning. I mean, this is what we have been doing. Uh, we learned enough from flying the space shuttle to understand how we might successfully live permanently in space, live for long stretches, many years mm-hmm. at, a, at a time, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to have a, a sustained human presence. Uh, now that we've learned how to do that, uh, 500 kilometers above the surface of the earth, I think it's time for us to start to practice for Mars and, uh, learn and understand what it takes to keep humans alive, uh, on another planet. And, uh, the moon is only a couple of days away and Mars is six months away. So Mm. this is a a good place to practice, I think for, for a lot of different reasons. (laughs) You know what? A a super strange thought to me, at least, is that we are going to Mars or trying to go to Mars and we're investing loads and loads of money to make Mars habitable like Earth. And we have that place right here, right now for free. Isn't that an interesting well, Strange thing. I mean, like yeah. if you took, if if you had aliens watch us, they would <laughs> perhaps ask themselves, "What are those guys doing?" Well, there are, there are a couple of answers to that question. I mean, certainly it's been brought up before that that uh, you know we are worried about our Earth and uh, having knowledge and understanding of. Uh, how, how to, how to go somewhere else, I think is a part of it. But I also just think there's a very human aspect of, uh, a yearning for knowledge. And Mars is terribly interesting from that standpoint because, uh, it is, you know, we, we have one planet. Uh, this is our only planet that we know Mm -hmm. about its geology, its biology, its atmosphere, all of those things. Uh, and you know, to me, if we could find life on Mars, uh, we would learn so much about, uh, our own lives. 
So I think it's uh, that's what's exciting. And I have to tell you, I have a call coming in for my two o'clock. Sure. Do I have five more minutes? No, I really don't. I've got a two o'clock phone calls in like okay. one minute. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Pamela, for that, <laughs> for that wonderful conversation. Yeah, hopefully. Did you get enough, do you think, for your podcast? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so uh, much. My, for my apologies. The time. I am on a very tight schedule today. So, no okay. worries. Okay. It's all good. Thanks. Well, this abrupt ending probably needs some explanation, and an explanation it has. So, to be honest, I was a little bit surprised about the quick end, but of course, I respect the eventful life we have to deal with, especially in this year. So, I ended the conversation and went to bed. On my side of the world, it was already evening, as I already mentioned at the beginning with the reference to my glass of wine I granted myself. The next day, I get a message from Torsten Kreening, the wonderful CEO of Space Watch Global, with the title, Pam is on Biden's transition team. A quick Google search confirms what had been announced behind the scenes. Pam Melroy is in the close advisory circle on space issues of de facto President Joe Biden. I'm still smiling today. The abrupt end of our recording, my naive question for an additional five minutes. Damn, what a story. In this episode, did we just talk to the future head of NASA? We will keep you up to date on this. As always, we are looking forward to hearing from you. And of course, we would be super happy if you would leave us a few stars as a rating. Space Watcher t-shirts are available at Space Watch Global Merchandise. And that would be a pretty cool Christmas present this year, by the way, I guess. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>